I want to talk about a living faith that brings freedom. Living faith that brings freedom. Now, America is the land of the free, right? We know that. And our freedom came at a great cost. And that great cost is we fought for it. We were actually subservient to the British Empire. And we had some brave souls sign their names on the Declaration of Independence. And uh, they were really signing off that if they didn't win this thing, they'd all be hung. Right? It's just simply as that. They put, put it all on the line. Well, you know how that turned out. We finally won the Revolutionary War. And uh, it says all men are created equal, but they weren't all treated equal. And it took uh, the rise of a new party, political party, the Republican Party to be in fact, which campaigned on the doctrine of abolition of slavery to bring a president to power, Abraham Lincoln, which really caused a war. And there was a battle between the states. Free states versus slave states, and the victory was on the side of the free states. And during that war, the president, Abraham Lincoln, signed the, the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing the slaves when the victory was won. And, uh, you know, every now and then they say, you know, this is the most crucial election in American history. I don't think so. I think that one was. It caused our nation to be divided, so it went to war, and then it was afterward to have to heal the nation. And that healing of the nation took nearly a hundred years until we had another uh, movement called the Civil Rights Movement. Now listen, freedom is expensive. It costs something. It costs something. He says that we fought for it. We set up a government after the Revolutionary War where we have a democratic, representative, Republican, or Republic government. We're not really a true democracy because you and I don't vote on every bill that goes to Congress. We're a republic. We have representatives. We vote in elections to place a representative to represent us to go to Washington. When the bills and laws are being made, we want them to vote the way we would vote. That's why we pick those representatives. They're supposed to reflect us. And so we have this democratic representative form of government that we fought for. That's how we got our freedoms. That's how we got our freedoms. So for this to work, it requires the people actually go and vote. That's why I started out this morning. How many of you voted already? How many of you are going to go vote? Because if it's going to truly represent we the people, we the people have to go and vote. Now, there's one more key piece to this. The people we vote for, it requires that they be honest candidates. Now, this is kind of where the whole thing seems to fall apart. Does anybody know of any truly honest politicians? When I was in Bible college, they had a visiting governor come to speak to chapel. And I remember it very clearly. He began saying, you know, we need more Christians in politics. Towards the end of his little sermon that he was doing, he said, you know, I don't know that you can be a Christian and be in politics. <laughs> it's a dirty business, you know. And so I thought, wow, that was an extreme. He didn't get 30 minutes in saying they're all corrupt. It really is important that we know who we are voting for. Really important. And you go online, you get the ballot, you can see what's on it, and you can then search it, and you can study it, and you can make an informed decision on who to vote for. It requires an honest candidate. Now, our text today is not about politics. I just know that this week we're voting, okay? It's not about politics. But the same is true what it's about. It's about spiritual freedom. It's about spiritual freedom. Not political freedom. Spiritual freedom. Being freed from your sins. Being free to worship and serve God. Being free uh, from uh, heresies and error and things that are wrong. It's about being free. Being free. But it also takes honesty. Honesty. It's so important. As we need honest candidates, we need honest preachers. Ooh. So in a certain sense, when I'm pointing my finger out at you, there's three pointing back at me, right? You have to have honest preachers and teachers. The key statement in our passage today, I think it's found in the 19th verse. We'll see it in a moment. It says, they promise 
The they are the false teachers, the false prophets that this, this, the chapter began on. <clears throat> he says, they promise them freedom. Who, who's the them? The people that they're, that they're trying to lead, these false teachers, who they're trying to teach and who they're trying to lead. He says, they promise them freedom, but their freedom brings slavery. It brings slavery. Watch. Verse 19. Key statement. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. Trying to tell you what you need to do, but they don't need to do it themselves. That does sound like politics, doesn't it? I'm sorry. There seems to be those who lead and tell us what we need to do, and then they don't do it themselves. It's kind of like they tell us that we have to be in Social Security, but they don't have to be. All right, and, and there's all kinds of these double standards that's been set up. He, he says that they promise their audience freedom while they themselves are slave to depravity. You see, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. Wow, that is a universal statement that is not just true of the, the, the teachers or the, the false prophets and the preachers that were going on in his day. That is a blanket statement you are a slave to whatever has mastered you. Think about this. The person who's an addict to drugs, he is a slave to his drug addiction. I can go down the list on these. The person that's a, a, addicted to alcohol, he's an alcoholic or she is, is a slave to the drink, slave to the bottle. There's some people that are a slave to greed. They just can never have enough. They never, never have enough, never satisfy. Oh, how about money? Some people are slave to money. They are workaholics. I don't necessarily think you have to be a slave to money to be a workaholic, because I consider myself a workaholic. But I don't think I'm the slave to the money. See, it's not the money. It's You know, in the King James Version, and towards the, the end of, um, I think it's 1 Corinthians, it says, the house of Stephanus, they were addicted to the ministry. Oh, and that wasn't a good thing. They were addicted to the ministry. You just had to do it. In any case, you, you, you are a slave. And in fact, how says, those people who are addicted to the ministry, they're slaves of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. You, you are a slave to whatever masters you. This is what he's saying. For some people, it's sex. It's pornography. It's the sex, sex trade. It's a, some, it's success. They'll, they would kill, literally kill, to succeed. They're addicted to, I got to succeed. I got to be first. I got to win. Some people are addicted to anger. You know the test of this? It's when somebody cuts you off on the road and you decide to give them the Italian salute and you get angry and upset. Yeah, you now are addicted. You're a slave to your anger. It's got control of you. You don't have control of it. Oh, lying. You ever meet a person who just can't tell you the truth? They just cannot tell you the truth. Often it comes in the form of they embellish the story so much it's unbelievable. Now, come on, we all embellish the stories a little bit, don't we? But some people, the embellished story is so fa fantastic and out there you know that they're lying to you because that's just the thing that they do because they're a slave to lying. Some people, it's jealousy that they're a slave to. Others, it's cheating. I cheat a lot in board games, I have to admit it. I do it mostly to get the goat of the other person who's a stickler. Yeah, my wife. <laughs> she knows not to go out of the room when we're playing a card game because I'll stack the deck. She'll come back in and we'll deal, and then we'll have them all set every fourth card, I get the good one. And uh, so, you know, whatever the, the cards are, I always get the good card, and, and then we'll play a hand, and I'll start laughing. I'll say, you didn't catch me. I, you know, it's just one of those things. Uh, but some people, cheating is their way of life. <clears throat> it's just their way of life. Some people, it's the selfie. And I'm not just talking about the phone, you know, taking their selfies. <clears throat> I had my kids, we went bowling, and we, we went to an arcade yesterday, my grandkids, <clears throat> and my my daughter-in-law told me, make sure you take some pictures. 
oh, I completely forgot because I'm not into that. I'm not. So my grandson said, Grandpa, you're supposed to take pictures. Well, we're all done bowling. So I said, oh, yeah, we got to go back to the bowling. <laughs> so we went back. We're all holding bowling balls so we can take a selfie <clears throat> so that she can later post it online because some people are just addicted to their slaves, to selfies. But I'm not talking just about taking pictures. I'm talking about being a slave to yourself. It is all about me. It's all about me, all about me, all about me. You see, some people are a slave to hatred and bitterness, anger, vengeance. They're all, they're so negative, it's always, I got to get even. I used to have an expression I used to teach people with. I'd say, watch out, I don't get even, I get ahead. <laughs> there are people that it's true of because they're a slave to that. They're a slave that masters them. Some, they're a slave to gossip. <clears throat> and it comes in a form of um, prayer request. You know, I'm going to, spill the beans about people that I shouldn't be spilling the beans about as a prayer request that somehow makes it sanctified and holy, but they just can't keep a secret. And they got to spill their guts all the time, all the time. They're a slave to that. They're just a slave to that. And other people are a slave uh, to sexual orientations. Other people are, are, are a, a slave to stuff. They amass, they hoard, and they have stuff and, and it's almost like, it's worth it if I never use it. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. All of these are things that you could be a slave to, but in the passage, he's not concerned about any single one of these, I don't believe. There's one far, far worse. Some people are a slave to heresy. What is heresy? Heresy is a false teaching. A false teaching. It's not from the Word of God. It's brought in from some other place. It's a doctrine that's been made up and invented. It's a heresy. It's an untruth. It's an untruth that that person has come to believe is truth because someone who is a religious person has told them it is the truth. I keep saying it, and you know, I grew up as a Berean. That is a, I went to the Berean Baptist Church, and the book of Acts, the, the, the Bereans were more noble than those at Thessalonica, because they searched the scriptures every day to see if what the Apostle Paul was saying was true. Do you know when you stand before God, he's not going to say to you, you know, when, when you're giving an account, you're not going to be able to say to him, oh, but ba Pastor, Pastor Dennis told me. He's going to say, what did, you, what did you do with what he said? Did you check it out? Do, what do you believe? Don't tell me what Pastor Dennis believes. What do you believe? What do you believe? What do you believe? Heresy is when you've embraced a false doctrine because you haven't compared it to the Word and formulated your doctrine based upon the Word of God, and you're just following what man says. You have to check that out. <clears throat> well, jumping back before that key phrase in there, uh, verse 19, we're going to jump back to verse 17. He says, spiritual slavery is empty. The cults are empty. They don't give you the hope that is in Jesus Christ. They're always pointing you somewhere else other than him. You need Jesus to be the focal point of your faith. These men are springs without water. These false teachers, these guys that are spreading these heresies that people are following, he says they're springs without water. And here I got this empty spring. There's no water coming up out of it. He says they are mists driven by a storm. They're a mist. Actually, Jude says the same things, only there it's translated like this. They are clouds without rain. So I got a cloud here. Watch, the cloud's going across. goes across. <clears throat> it's that cloud being blown by the wind. It goes across. It doesn't rain. It doesn't fill the empty cistern or spring. There's nothing. There's no depth. There's nothing of spiritual value in what they're saying. So he says here, hey, spiritual slavery is empty. He goes on, he says, it's blackest darkness is reserved for them. It, it, it's, it's black, it's bleak. It, it's <clears throat> other places in the scripture, it says, they'll be thrown in a place where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth, and it's black, and it's also hot. There's flames there. It's all those things going on, and there's smoke ascending. It's, it's a terrible place. 
their spiritual, their spiritual slavery is absolutely empty. The next verse says that, for they mouth empty, boastful words. What they say is empty. There's no spiritual value in that preacher or that teacher. By appealing to your, ah, your lusts. The prosperity gospel really does appeal to that. God wants you to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and demon-free. And it appeals to all the things that you want. And that, that God is going to only bless you no matter what. God is out there for good for you. And it's a feel-good Christianity. And he says, it's a satisfy your lust. It's all about you and not what you can sacrifice for him. It's all backwards. All backwards. <clears throat> they say these empty words, lustful words. They're he says, of the sinful nature, they're springing from all the things on the dark side, not things coming from the bright side. They entice people, so they're enticing. It's not enough that they have the air, they want to bring as many along as they can down the path of air too. They're enticing people to fall into the same black hole. He says they entice people who are just escaping. These are new Christians. They find out that they're a new Christian. They've got to latch on to them and say, come on over here. It was happening in Paul's day with the Galatians. The Galatians were coming to Christ, and then the Judaizers came along and said, no, you don't just need Jesus. You need to keep the law and get circumcised. Then you can be fully saved. And Paul says, no, why would you trade in your freedom in Christ for slavery to all the rules? Oh. They're enticing people who are just escaping from, the, uh, uh, from those who live in air. They're, they're just getting out of all of that. And he goes on, he says, back to our verse, verse 19. <laughs> they promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity, all those things. But mostly a heresy, false teaching, false teaching. The next thing is, he says, spiritual slavery is escapable. You can get freed. He says, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that is the only way to escape the corruption, is you must come to Jesus, you must call on him as your Savior and be saved. And you can escape all the slaveries that we've already mentioned, and the heretical slavery too. Then he throws in this warning. For if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome by it, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Whoa. This is a warning. It's a warning. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about those who draw back in chapter 10. And then chapter 11, it says, it says but we are not of those who draw back, but we are of those who, are, who believe in Jesus to the saving of our souls. And he gives a hall of heroes in chapter 11. Man of faith, woman of faith, all these people of faith, down through the whole chapter. But it's a dangerous thing to have a knowledge of the truth, but never use and appropriate it in your life so that it's real in your life. It would be better, he says, for them not to have known the way of righteousness, that Jesus is the way, than to have known it and then turn their back on the sacred commands that was passed on to them. Oh my goodness. When I preach the gospel, it is a double-edged sword. All right? When I, it's aroma, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's aroma of life to those who believe. I draw that in and I get my life from the gospel but it is an aroma of death to those who do not believe because they are condemned for not having believed on the only begotten Son of God. That's what he's saying. Danger, danger. He goes on in verse 22. He says, of them, this is so disgusting. Listen to this. Of them. Is the prophets, it's the, the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. <laughs> Now, most of you didn't even know that word was in the Bible, did you? Somebody once said, it's like, that's, that's just a little bit better than just saying he returned to his puke. The whole idea is here, the, the dog is the teacher, and he's returning to the heresy that he's taught. And he himself is looking it up now and believing it. Oh, 
How gross and disgusting is that? And then he turns and he says another metaphor, and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. You can clean up and you can wash a pig. But because that pig has a pigly nature, I mean, you can put little cute little bows on the ears and one on the tail, and you can scrub it and clean it up. And you turn that pig loose in the backyard after rain and it will find a mud puddle to roll around it because its nature is a pigly nature. When we were born because of original sin, we saw that last time. Wherefore is by Adam one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We were all in Adam because we're the human race. The whole human race fell in him. When I was born, I was born with a sinful human nature, and I had a sinful nature, not a pigly nature. I had a sinful nature, and my inclination is to run into the muck and the mire of sin. You can wash me, clean me up as a sinner, and that's called reformation. You can try to reform a person, but unless they have a spiritual regeneration deep inside by the Holy Spirit of God, they will not change. Their nature and inclination is still to go wallow in all the sins that they used to do. <clears throat> and he says, this is what the Proverbs all about. Without something changing deep within, you're going to go back to a disgusting lifestyle. Spiritual slavery is revealing to these folk. They've heard the truth. They appear to have rejected it. 1 John 2.19, I've changed books. It says they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. You don't lose your salvation. If you turn your back on Christ after you know the truth, you turn your back on Christ. The truth is you really never embraced him as your savior to begin with. Because if you had, you would have belonged to him. Jesus said, I know my sheep and they know me. Very simple, very simple. Now, <clears throat> I want to illustrate this just a little bit. Spiritual slavery here is now illustrated <clears throat> by the, the, the parable Jesus taught about the sower. <clears throat> Jesus taught about <clears throat> a sower went out and he sowed and he threw, it, threw some seed and some landed on a path, some landed on a hard, a rocky soil. <clears throat> and it lands on different soils, but finally good soil. I want to focus just on the farmer when he went out to sow a seed and some fell on a rocky place where it did not have much soil and sprang up so quickly. It was, wow, look at this. Because the soil was shallow, it couldn't take root. Okay, so there it springs up and we got this plant coming up out of the ground. But because it was so shallow, he says, <clears throat> It then vanishes away, but watch. He tells us that in the interpretation of, of that parable. He says this. The one who re receives the seed that fell on the rocky place is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Wow, this is good stuff. He has an emotional experience with this. He says, this is wonderful. And, and, but because it never gets deeply rooted, he has no root system in the truth. He's just an emotional high over this thing. It says, but since he has no root, it lasts only a short period of time. We've all seen this. People who heard the word of God and supposedly made a profession of faith, and then he's only there for a little while. Why? Something like trouble comes along? Persecution comes along? Maybe a heresy comes along? But because, uh, because of the word, he quickly falls away. He's gone. That's true. I hear this all the time. Well, Joey, when he was five years old, accepted Jesus as his Savior, and I said, and where is he at today? Well, he hasn't, since he was eight years old, ever darkened the church again. But I know he's saved. Wait. He might have sprung up with great joy, but if he doesn't, has no root, he's gone. He really didn't have it. It didn't take root. The Word of God never got deep in his heart. 
Paul had those people in, in, in his ministry too. There's this guy by the name of Demas. We find in 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas, because he loved this world, he loved this world. He was worldly minded. We call that a carnal man. He has deserted me and he's gone to Thessalonica. He's left. He's cut out. He's no longer, he's no longer with us. He's a deserter to the cause. We go to another place and he talks about those who are shipwreck. <clears throat> he says, holding, actually, hold on to faith and a good conscience. He got these two things. Hold on to faith and good conscience. That's what he's talking about. He says, some have rejected them. What? Faith and good conscience. They started out like that. They received it enthusiastically, and then they deserted like Demas. They have rejected. They turn around and said, no, I don't believe that anymore. And they have shipwrecked their faith. They didn't truly believe. They had it up here, but not in their heart. They shipwrecked their faith. And then he goes on and he names them. Among them are Hymenus, Hymenaeus. And he says, in another place, he says, this is what, what happened to him. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. All right, I thought I could gross you out. And that, that served its purpose. False teaching to God is just like that. Just like that. He said... Their teaching, these false teachers, will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. You see, if they'd been of us, they would have stayed among us, but they weren't of us, so they left us. They say, here, here, here's, the, here's the gangrenous doctrine, heresy they're teaching. They're, they say that the resurrection has already taken place. You know what he's saying? The Lord's come back and you missed them. Ha <laughs> ha, you're in big trouble, so you better follow me. What a lie. We're still waiting for the Lord to come back and resurrect us out of this world. They're saying that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. They're actually destroying the faith in the, the, the believers who are new and not grounded in the word. You've got to be in the word to have growth in your life to withstand these things. He mentioned also about Alexander. He said, not only is it Hymenaeus, but it's also Alexander, who I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme like that. Well, Alexander is also mentioned later. Alexander, the metal worker, uh, he has done great harm. He's done a great deal of harm to me. And the Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him. Because he strongly opposes our message. Listen, he's telling us as the readers, put up your guard. Watch out. There's false teachers, false preachers. You know how you put up your guard? You get into the Bible. You read it for yourself. You compare what is being said to what is in the word. And you will be able to guard against the heresies when they come your way. Then there's this guy, Simon. This is how, how close it gets. Whew. In the book of Acts, in the 8th chapter, we've got this guy by the name of Simon. He was a sorcerer. We see that in the very verse, verse here in verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city, and he amazed all the people of Samaria. <clears throat> he boasted that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> he was someone great. In fact, here was his boast. And all the people, uh, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, here it is, this man is divine power known as the great power. <laughs> this guy's claiming to be God. Whew. He's claiming to be God. Because he's a sorcerer, he's doing tricks, he's uh, doing sleight of hand, he's doing his magic works, he's using his magical potions, you know, we call them drugs today. The Greek word is pharmakeia. We get pharmacy from it. They're, they're drug-induced uh, <clears throat> highs and things like that he's doing. <clears throat> they followed him because he amazed them for a long time with magic. With magic. He was tricking them. He was deceiving them. And my grandson said, Grandpa, I've got to show you some of my magic tricks. And he's learning to do some sleight of hand. And he's making coins disappear and cards disappear and 
It was so cute and clever, and, but, but he couldn't help but then show me how he did it. <laughs> he wasn't a very good sorcerer or magician because he did, hey, Grandpa, this is how I did it. <laughs> and so, uh, and it was very clever. I said, oh, those were really good. He's very good at it. And then he's practicing really, good, really with this thing. But there's all sleight of hand. It, it's deception. It's to make you believe something that's really not there. And so he's practicing. He's a pro at deceiving people. He's a pro at this. So, but then comes along <clears throat> Philip, the evangelist. And when they believed Philip, the, 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 his followers, the they, they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. All right, so here's what we got. Philip comes along. He's preaching the good news. They're believing him. The audience is believing Philip. So he, he's taking away from the sorcerer's group. He's taking them away. They're now following him. And in fact, his, his audience has left him and has gone to Philip. And Philip, after they believe, they're baptized. And this is the order in which you get baptized. You accept the word of God. You do the preaching. You believe it. And then you get baptized. And so it goes on and says, Simon himself believed. He believed. Now there's a different kinds of faith. You've got to realize this. In the book of James, it says, even the demons believe and tremble. All right? What it's saying, he acknowledged in his head. But Romans says you've got to believe in your heart. Some people miss heaven by 12 inches, the distance between their head and their heart. They know the facts and say, I believe that. But they've never received Christ in their heart where they commit themselves totally to him. This is crucial in this passage. He believed, and based upon that profession of faith, he gets baptized. The orders there is the same. You believe and get baptized. You believe and get baptized. It's all the way through the book of Acts like that. You believe first, then you get baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere. He was a tag along. He's tagging along. And he's tagging along because he's astonished by the signs and the miracles that he saw. It's not about his preaching. It's about what he's doing, these miracles. And he thinks it's more magic. Oh, I got to learn their magic stuff because they're doing these miracles. Wow, I want to pick up on that too. And so we find that he says, when some of the apostles in Jerusalem, okay, I got Jerusalem on the map. Samaria is up at the top edge of that round circle. He says, when they had heard in Jerusalem what was going on in Samaria, that the Samaritans had accepted the word of God, the preaching through Philip, they sent Peter and John up to Samaria to find out what's going on. Why? Up to this point, the church has been all Jewish. They're all Jews. Now, Gentiles are accepting Christ. Whoa, we better find out what's going on up there. Because you see, the Samaritans were not full Jews. They were half Gentile, part Jewish. And so the Jews wouldn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. And so now that God, these people are accepting Christ too. Is there going to be two churches, the Jewish one and the Samaritan one, just like it was in the Old Testament, where there was the kingdom of Judah? In the south, the kingdom of Israel in the north, is this all over again? And so they sent to find out what's going on. And when they arrived, they prayed for them. And it says that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And then he adds this. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They'd only been water baptized. They believed the message based upon the profession of faith. They're baptized, not in a tank, probably in a river. They're brought up out of the water. And he said, but they have not received the Holy Spirit. So he goes on in the text and it says, Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now this is really strange because why the delay? We receive the Holy Spirit at the point of our salvation. We find that in other parts of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13. And other places. We find if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. If, of his. So if, you're not one of, if you are one of His, then you've got the Holy Spirit. That's the way it works. Why the delay here? And the delay is simply explained. God didn't want there to be two different kinds of churches. The Jews and the Gentiles are to be in the church together 
And when they laid their hands on the Holy Spirit came to them, saying, this is the same church that is in Jerusalem. It's in Samaria. Remember when I told you, preach the gospel in Jerusalem, then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. He said, this is what I had in mind. We're going to be collecting people from every nation, every tongue, and they're all going to be in the body of Christ together. And he's saying there's not two churches. We are just one church in Christ. When Simon saw the Spirit was given by laying on of hands by the apostles, he offered them money and said, how much can I pay you for that magic trick? How much money? Can I, I want to do that. He said, give me also this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands, I might receive the Holy Spirit. I want what you're doing. I want to have that power. And immediately, Peter answers, may your money his expression, perish with you. Who's perishing here? Simon the sorcerer. He said, your money, it can go perish along with you. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God. Listen, Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood. He paid for the gift of God, eternal life. He paid for the gift of God and all the gifts of the Spirit. He paid for it all. And you think that you can shell out some money and get the gift of God? No way. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God everywhere. It's always grace, grace, grace. And what he was trying to do was buy the magic powers. Listen. Peter said, you have no part or share in this ministry. He cut him off. <laughs> because your heart is not right with God. He was not right with God. Back when he believed, he believed in his head like, wow, this stuff is amazing. And he said, yeah, I, I, I'll be baptized too. And then when that, it was never in his heart. See, the text saying your heart is not right with God. You believed in your head, but you didn't believe in your heart. You've missed it by 12 inches. You've missed it. You've missed it. Peter says, repent. See, he never did repent. He never turned from his wicked way. He never turned from himself. He never turned from his magic and turned to Christ as his Savior. He says, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you. Perhaps he'll let that go if you just repent and call upon him. He'll forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. He says, for I see that you are full of bitterness because we took away all your magic tricks crowd. We took them away. You're full of bitterness. And you're, a, there it is, captive to sin. You're a slave. You're still a slave. You're still a slave. Simon's faith was not sincere, not in the heart, only the head. When I read 1 Timothy, it talks about, ah, Timothy has a sincere faith. <laughs> sincere faith in his heart. He really believes. He really trusts. You see, there are those who, like the devil, they believe and tremble. But it's only a, a mental thing. It's not a heart thing. Timothy had a sincere heart, sincere faith. Wow. So Simon responds, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. He realizes where he's at. The rest of the story breaks away from there, and we don't know how the Peter responded from there. But we do know, as long as he was in a state where he only believed in his head, but not in his heart, he was not any part of Christ's. Back to our key statement, the book we're in. They promised them freedom. <laughs> See, that, this magician was trying to promise them because he wanted to get money, get glory, get fame. They promised freedom. But he himself was a slave to his sin. That's the whole passage is about here. He says they promise freedom, but only Jesus brings freedom. Only Jesus brings freedom. In John chapter 8, Jesus says to the Jews, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, now these are believing Jews. He says, if you hold to my teaching, the word of God, you are really my disciples. If you don't hold to the word of God and you say you're a disciple, you're not. 
But if you really do hold to the teachings of Christ, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's the truth. It's the word. Later, Jesus says in his prayer in John chapter 17, Lord, or Father, sanctify them, set them apart through the truth. Your word is truth. You want to be free, you get in the book. You get in the Bible. You read the Word of God. You read about Jesus. And you, read, you build, develop a biblical worldview, and it will set you free every single day. You'll be set free. You'll be set more free and more free. Jesus said in another place, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. <laughs> no, there are dogs and hogs. The Bible never, ever in any place calls a believer a dog or a pig or a hog. Believers are called sheep. We're sheep with a shepherd. We're sheep with a shepherd. You do not believe because you're a dog, you're a hog. Because you're not my sheep. If you're my sheep, you wouldn't be a dog or a hog. My sheep, listen to my voice. When I read the Word of God, the Word of God speaks to me. It convicts me. It reproves me. It instructs me, enlightens me. And there are times where it blesses me and encourages me and strengthens me because I hear my Savior speaking in the words of the Scripture. He speaks to us through His Word. He says, my sheep hear my voice. They listen to my voice. And I know them and they know me. And they follow me. They follow me. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. You'll never lose your salvation when you really know Jesus. So these people that Peter was talking about, false teachers, they didn't even know the Lord. They were a lot like Simon. They wanted these magical powers to pull an audience. He says, listen, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I am like my remote, and I've been placed in the hand of Jesus. And then God the Father has got him wrapped up too. I am doubly secure in Jesus because as an eight-year-old boy, I gave him my heart. I didn't give him so much my head because I didn't know much then. I gave him my heart, and my head followed. Most people, as adults, they give the head, and the heart has to follow. But as a child, they generally give their heart, and then the education and the head follows. And you know that he is your shepherd because you hear his voice. whole idea here is don't accept the words of the false prophets. Accept the word of the Lord. Accept Jesus, and you will be free. That's what Peter's talking about. Accept Jesus, and you will be free. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the warnings from Peter here in Second Peter, and then the positive notes that we pull from other places, that we have a real relationship with Jesus, more than just in our head, but in our heart that we know him, we love him, we serve him, we live for him, we enthrone him in our hearts, we enthrone him in our minds, we follow in the steps of Jesus because we love him. Lord, that's, that, that's what Jesus said to the disciples. You'll follow him and the truth will set you free. Free us, O oh Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.